So uh, this is uh, the third part of our uh, single cell leak analysis uh, workshops uh, using the Vizar platform. In the previous two, we uh, went through Cell Ranger and uh, Sorat. Uh, uh, Bernie here uh, developed the Sorat app. And um, the, if you miss them and you would like, they're both are recorded and, uh, and they are also on the uh, website. And uh, this session will be also recorded, and uh, we'll put it in the website as well uh, after the meeting. So uh, the slides, uh, you can download them from here. They're actually live right now. So um, let's uh, let's see what Monocle is. Um, the Monocle is is an R uh, package that has been developed by the Trapnel Lab. Uh, they are the same, uh, it's the same lab who they have developed Top Hat and Cufflinks, uh, as you probably have heard about before. So uh, one of the main contributions uh, has been introducing a strategy of ordering single, cell, uh, single cells in, in pseudo time. So basically, uh, you, you, when you start with your um, raw uh, single cell data, uh, through a pipeline, a set of steps that we'll go through uh, quick, uh, in a few moments, uh, you end up uh, ordering yourself in these uh, trajectories. So what these trajectories are is, these points first of all are cells, and what these trajectories show is, uh, is basically shows which uh, cells are in which stages of the biological process. So, um, so for example, in this image, you see uh, you have state one. So it tries to, without having any prior knowledge, it tries to uh, look at the gene expressions of the cells and tries to see how those cells have, have developed and have uh, differentiated uh, to go into states. So it tries to do some sort of a, uh, uh, unsupervised, through an unsupervised uh, learning approach. So it basically tries to say, okay, these are a group of cells, and then they differentiated at uh, here at point two. Uh, so there's a branch here, and then went to further, and then there's another branch four. There's another differentiation. This is another group of cells, and branch one and three, and so on. So this is the actual contribution of the mock, or like the most valuable contribution of it to have. And then we'll go through how basically we can get this uh, uh, using this, this R as, a, as the platform. Uh, so the documentations uh, for Monaco, for people who want to know more about the theory or the process uh, is in their website. There's also a useful tutorial uh, by Dave Tang who, who goes through this process sort of in a more uh, descriptive manner, uh, which you can also look at if you were interested. So, uh, in a nutshell, uh, this is the steps to go through to do the analysis. Uh, you start with your uh, raw single cell data, and initially you perform some sort of filtering uh, by basically removing the outlier cells, cells that uh, have either too few or too many expressions, uh, and, and then uh, a step, and so now you're left with uh, a portion of your cells, say 90% of your cells, or maybe more, and with uh, and uh, with with a few uh, tens of thousands of genes, like 30,000 genes per, per cell. Now, uh, there's a dimensionality reduction step, which actually looks at uh, all those genes and tries to reduce uh, them to fewer features uh, per cell. This is to allow uh, further processing. Basically, this is to reduce all those genes to a fewer number of features that describe the most variance, basically, across this. Afterwards, there's a clustering step, uh, which uh, tries to find these clusters of, of cells. Um, then, based on that, there's a differential expression analysis step, which, in one case, you can, it can be done by comparing the cells, uh, basically these clusters of cells, or if your data has some phenotype information already, for example, if it's a time course data, you already have this 
distinction between uh, the cells, you can also do differential expression analysis using that information. You can say, uh, uh, find the DE genes based on whether based on the time course, uh, where, uh, like, and then uh, after that, there's uh, the single cell trajectories, which grabs the genes that were detected as differential expression, uh, differential expressed, and then tries basically to say, these are the important genes, how I can lay out the cells, uh, uh, find a layout for the cells based on the expression patterns of the genes uh, throughout um, the process. So, we'll basically go through each of these steps, and I'll just show how to use this R to perform each. So the mouse lab. So so, Vizar is is a desktop application. You uh, may already know. You can download it uh, from this link, and once you open it, you have uh, um, you have basically it's a directory. You open it, and based on the platform you have, you you choose the the uh, the correct launcher. So here I'm going to use the OS X one and. Um, This is the old one. I'm just gonna close. So it starts up like this, and there's a there's a lot of other apps which um, I won't go through them today, but uh, but there are some tutorials to use use them. But here we'll just focus on the monocle. So the way it works is, you can either go and find the app. So in this case, we have uh, our monocle app in the sequencing single cell. And among the other uh, these uh, the other apps, there's the monocle, or you can just do a search uh, if you know about the app, and then drag and drop the app to the workspace. And uh, and the way all the apps work, they have this uh, main screen, which is going to be the output shown if there is like graphical output, and then here are the parameters uh, that uh, you would specify. And um, so, so you would drag and drop the app into the workspace, and uh, you have the parameters. Now, the first part is specifying the input to uh, to Monocle. So uh, we have several ways of specifying input. So the most uh, simple or common one is if you have your raw single cell data uh, from uh, the um, 10 Excel Ranger pipeline output. So you would you can just specify that. Um, if you do any processing, further processing with the app, it saves its uh, processing into uh, these monocle app objects. So this is useful if, for example, you have gone through uh, half of your pipeline, which usually takes t takes takes a while. Like it can take like half an hour, a few hours, based on how big your data is. And then later you want to change a parameter somewhere somewhere down in the line. And you don't want to, again, run the entire tool for a few hours. So you can just say load the existing object and then just to ch change the parameters for, for further down, down the uh, pipeline. So that I will show that in a second. But let's just go over the basic version. Uh, next. And then we just to specify the uh, directory. If you have seen the um, single cell data, you know there's, uh, there's usually this uh, uh, data set with an out directory inside. So we we'll just open uh, this directory, not the outs one, just the parent directory. And then you can specify whether they are raw counts or already normalized FPKM or log, no, log normalized. Uh, again, the most common is when you have just the raw UMIs. Uh, second is use, uh, since this will be writing, um, as it uh, pro uh, progress, it will write the results like output tables or figures, everything into a directory, a specified directory that's going to contain the, uh, the output. And uh, here I would just specify this. Um, in order to make sure you don't overwrite the existing uh, results you have, there's this box is is selected by default. 
Again, this is to make sure it just creates a new subdirect subdirectory every time you run. So in case you uh, play with the parameters, now things are broken, you can always go back and say, okay, this was the version, and these are the parameters that was used to generate these plots. So you can always run. So um, I'm not going to run all of these steps. So I'm going to run a few of them that I know going to take just um, a couple minutes, but uh, I will show the pre generated results for each of these steps. Um, but I will go through each and show how they are. Um, they are basically set. So when when we run the app, so this is all you have to specify as a default. So once you have specified this, you can say run and then go and come back after maybe a couple hours, I guess, to uh, for a small data set of 27,000 cells, it takes about an hour and a half to go through the entire pipeline. So you can just say run, and then um, then come back after an hour and a half, or check check how the progress is. Um, uh, for a data set that's larger, like 8,000 cells, I think it will take a few hours to finish. But you can check the, the, the process that it goes through. So once it's done, uh, the output will be saved uh, in the directory that uh, was specified. Um, so here, uh, uh, this is the cell ranger one, the monocle one. So this is the output that uh, I got just this morning running the app. So, um, well, I guess the most popular one is this plots PDF uh, file, which uh, is the plots generated for each step of the pipeline. And I will go. I'll go through them uh, in a second. But, ba but uh, basically, this is this is the steps, the output of each. Oops. Um, the output of. Uh, uh, there you go. The output of each step and uh, and. Uh, and the parameters that probably was used. Again, this is sort of your package, like your report that, that you can just keep. And um, we'll go through the details of each uh, in a second. Uh, the second probably important prim the one is, is the parameters that was used at the time. So if you were wondering, OK, what threshold I set, um, if, if you change the default threshold. And then this is this monocle app object. Uh, that RDS file. This is after each step, it saves the results of that sp that stage, so you can actually resume from that stage later. So if you ran a few steps, did the dimensional reduction, and then did the differential expression analysis, and now you want to change something in the differential expression analysis, you don't have to run the entire thing. You run, you open this this file, and then you say uh, basically don't run the existing steps, just start from. And then these are the tables, like the, the cells table with the, uh, with the clustering information, which uh, if we have time, I can show how you can use Vizar to do some interactive exploration of it. Okay. I already went through this. So this is you either input uh, using the 10x data set or the uh, existing monocle app object. Uh, you specify the output, and now let's start with the analysis steps. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, these are the main analysis steps that we go through. Um, if you look at the with our app, um, we have these analysis steps here, so you can uh, you can enable which ones you want to go. So, so let's just for the sake of uh, the stem well, let's just go and then just do the filtering of the cells. Uh, so if we have lo used the um, raw data, we, can we have to go through all of these steps sequentially. Like we can't skip clustering and run differential uh, expression analysis. However, if I had chosen to use existing monocle object, um, here, I would take the risk that already those steps are done in it. Like if, if they're not done, the app will give an error that I couldn't find this information. But since 
you are saying that, okay, I already have an RDS file, which you know that, for example, you have done these steps. Now you can actually say don't do these steps and only do the differential expression analysis. And now you will only have to specify differential expression analysis information. So this is if you have if you are looking at your plots and say, okay, this threshold that was set there doesn't feel right. I want to redo that step and then afterwards. Um, and then you don't want to wait another hour for the pre-existing steps. Uh, so I'll just go back to the 10x input and uh, already directory is specified so I have to um, let's say filter the cells and uh, oops I have to disable the differential expression analysis okay okay so with filter cells and Let's see what the filtering does before actually we perform this. So, so when you start with your original data, so this is uh, when we plot the, the our cells. And so uh, on the x-axis, it may be hard to see. It's a total expression per, per cell. So it's summing all the UMI counts for each cell. So each cell uh, have multiple genes. And for each gene, there's a UMI count. So we sum them up that becomes the x-axis. So for example, these are the ones that have a high UMI count, almost an outlier. And uh, usually this is the result of doublets, <coughs> right? Or multiplets, yeah. Pardon? Doublets or multiplets. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we want to uh, get rid of those outliers, uh, outlier cells, because uh, most likely they're going to skew our analysis later. And the recommended way that uh, Monaco does is to uh, calculate the mean uh, total expression per cell and standard deviation and go if, uh, uh, basically a, a neighborhood around that mean. So by default, they say use mean um, plus minus uh, twice the standard deviation. Or you can increase that threshold maybe later if, 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 you, uh, if you feel for example, if you, if you think that you don't have so many cells to sacrifice them, you want to actually don't filter them, you want to grab them all. Or if you are looking at this plot and you see that you don't actually have any outliers, it's, it's, it looks, looks good enough. Uh, or you can re remove it to be a bit more strange. You can reduce that, that, that threshold. So um, this threshold is something that you can set and the filtering parameters on the VizRC. So again, uh, you can ignore all these parameters because you're going to see there are going to be many of them. Uh, they are, we have tried to initialize them with the ones that are recommended, like, but, but again, as you go through your data based on how your data is, if you are looking at the plots, uh, you may think that, okay, I will need to, to modify some of them. So that plot isn't created until you do the filtering. Because usually you want to base it on the plot. But exactly. You have to go through that filter step first, then you can. Yeah. So, 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 so you. That's basically. Um, uh, it's it's as you said. It, like you have to do it once with the default, and look at it and say, okay, does it make sense or not? And not if not, then um, you redo it with a sort of a new value. So, so it, that's that's why it's a good. Um, uh, strategy basically to do these steps one by one if you really want to validate uh, each step before moving on to the next step yeah so if, if so since this step is quick I'm just gonna uh, uh, select it so I have selected the filtering set so now I see that there's a filtering uh, parameter set uh, uh, okay I should actually go through the subsetting of the of the genes before I run this so that's if you want, that's filtering the cells, so first step. Next is you want to also uh, remove your outlier genes, like genes that either don't contribute much, so genes that either don't have counts. Uh, uh, I guess in this case, that, that's the ones we are, we are removing, genes that don't have counts, um, because we already have got rid of the cells uh, that, uh, that were outliers. So there are two ways. Uh, that again, Monaco uh, suggests you can use to um, remove, um, uh, or I shouldn't say remove. This is subsetting genes. This is 
specifying which genes to include further in the analysis. So the default way is to t take the um, average expression of each gene. So for each gene, you average the expression across all cells. And then you would say, so here's the x-axis uh, on the log scale. Uh, and, and the y-axis here, for your information, is the dispersion. Uh, so, so by default, uh, you would say, um, get the mean and then filter anything that has less than 0 0.1 um, uh, average expression. So this is roughly, uh, it, it, should, it wouldn't be, but roughly it, you'd say anything that was, if every, every cell, every gene was expressed, just had one UMI per cell, then this 0 0.1 would be uh, get rid, only use the top 90% genes. I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's not precise what I'm saying, but that's if, if each gene just had, was, uh, had just one count per cell. Uh, the other way to subset them is uh, based on uh, the minimum number of expressed cells. So you would say um, only keep genes that were expressed in at least a certain percent of cells. So by default you say, I want everything that's expressed in at least 5% of cells. So genes that were expressed in less than 5%, uh, you can ignore. So there are these two methods. And by default, uh, the top one uh, true. So, so we'll keep the top one. So if the top one is used, we have this uh, threshold. Uh, uh, what's the average expression? If we choose minimum percent, then we would say, okay, what do you count a gene to be expressed? Like I would say, okay, a gene is expressed in a cell if it at least has one count. Or you can say, no, I, I only consider genes that are expressed in a cell if they have at least 10 reads. Again, this is, uh, this is later, based on your data, how noisy your data is. Uh, so usually like this, uh, this data set that we are using for this example is like a clean data, like it's a demo data that 10x has put there. Usually in a, in a uh, your... Sorry, is it, is it reads or is it unique U UMI, so un unique barcodes, yeah. yeah. And this hasn't been library assessed on library anymore. Like that, I, I think so. Yeah, I think this is this is raw, but I would say it was prepared nicely, right? If they have prepared it, like uh, I assume that it's prepared. Yeah. Sorry, you said um, the minimum gene expression threshold. That's per cell, or that's per data set? That's average. So average. if you go, uh, if you go the other one, so so you uh, for each gene you average all expressions. Okay. And then, um, so average expression in all the, say, 2,700 um, cells that you have, so okay. per each gene. Okay. And then you have an average now for each gene. Mm -hmm. Now you would say, okay, pick only genes that have an average above a certain. Okay. Uh, again, this is something that after you run this once, you can look at this plot and then see, okay, whether it makes sense or not. Also, again, this is a bit hard to see in this plot, but on the, uh, on the caption. But here it says um, 2,200 of the genes almost passed this threshold. So again, you can, you can do this thresholding and see how many genes pass that threshold. This might be a bit easier to see in the, um, in the, in the actual plots um, later, but uh, a bit hard to see it here. Can you say something about the distribution? Why there's two kinds of bugs out? These guys? Um, I don't quite know. Uh, I, I actually never noticed until now. And I haven't, I don't know if, if we look at this, uh, look at another data, it's, uh, um, or if you look at it um, in. I think it's similar for the harder data. I went at uh, one the x axis is the mean expression. That lower end of expression so one you have my versus two you have my oh I see so so if, if you have one or two it's gonna make a big difference in terms of your why like I, I I see okay. I see so 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 I yeah, yeah that's that's a, that's a that's a that's a good explanation so so it, it basically you have more noisy uh, like 
if for you're gonna have w one group that has a just one UMI, so the dis dispersion is also uh, low, and then you have if if you, ones that have more than one, if you and then those gonna have a higher dispersion, right? Yeah. yeah. So this group is you are, this this cloud is probably those that have a, a UMI one, just uh, just uh, and then. But it's 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 something that can be exp uh, explored. Um, actually, um, this is something you can look at later um, um, through the uh, interactive apps that are in Vizar. Like you can load this table and actually go through those points and actually actually have a better look. Uh, any other question before I move on? Okay, so so we, then we would just run this. Uh, hopefully, all the param I have set the output directory. You run. Uh, it loads the Monocle package. It, it basically shows the progress. Uh, it's loading the data. Uh, it's doing some normalization. And, um, the entire filtering process shouldn't take more than a minute for this data so and while this is running you can also look at the console so this is actually what's being sent to R so on the back end Vizar is using um, R so you can actually see what commands are being run once this is done basically you have this, this report with filtering and subsetting and that's it and then uh, if we go to that uh, output directory that we specified, now there's a new directory with the current time, which has the plots and... So once we have this filtered uh, cells and genes, the next step is doing dimensional reduction. So for dimensional reduction, um, a common method that's used is called T-SNE. You probably have heard about it, but in order to run T-SNE, running T-SNE on the entire set of genes, even, even after subsetting them, uh, like having 2,000, is very slow. So a common approach is first to use another dimensional reduction method called PCA and, and reduce those 2,000 genes uh, to, to fewer principal components. And then run the uh, TCN on it. Um, the, uh, so, bef so once you do the PCA, you can see uh, how many actually dimensions do you need to keep uh, that explain your variance. So here, the default is 50, but I can see that even 50 is probably too high. Maybe somewhere around 15 would have been enough. So that's something that you can actually specify in your um, number of principal components. Again, uh, I think you will get a bit better T-SNE results if you have, uh, if, you, if, you have, if this is too big, it's gonna be too, too slow, and also T-SNE, I believe, may, um, may, may act not as good as when you, have, when you have selected principal components that are really descriptive of your variance. Um, so if, if I'm looking at this data, uh, I would go and um, modify my uh, principal component to maybe 15 and, and then run this. And then the dimension reduction, there are multiple methods. The most common one is TSNE. Once this step is run, these two plots are going to be added to output, uh, uh, this um, uh, PCA um, the components, uh, the variance explained by each of the PCA components, and the output of TSNE. So what TSNE has done is it has projected all your cells, in this case, I believe uh, 2,600, about 100 of them were filtered, and then about 2,600 were left uh, out of the original 2,700. And then they are projected into this two-dimensional step. Are there other options for the PCA? Or so that step, uh, no, they just say re reduce, first of all, just re because all these genes, a lot of them uh, sort of act the same because they are all like uh, uh, just expressed in a few cells or something, right? Yeah. 
So you would first say, just get a summary of those features that are really descriptive of the data. And PCA is the one, the fastest method to do that. Right. Like, that's why it's like uh, Sorat and even, uh, I'm not sure what uh, Cell Ranger, but even I think Cell Ranger uses first PCA yeah. before doing a TSNE. That's like accepted method. Yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, yes. Do you expect people using the plate based single cell to do this, or is everyone here doing 10x and drops and stuff? Uh, here, people use 10x, but uh, uh, so so what's the output in those cases? You get the text file, like, as yeah, count? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it would work. My only concern is that most people doing that, they only have, like, 96 cells. And I've noticed, especially for TSNE, since it's, like, first step of that is, like, a King or Snake was graph-based. Oh, yeah, yeah. You need to tweak the parameters because, like, I think the default is, like, 30 mm -hmm. nearest neighbors, and that's a third of their data sets. So mm -hmm, yeah, uh, then I'm not sure uh, if 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 maybe in that case uh, I if he, if you have such data we can look at it actually um, after the talk together and see if if so that's maybe the reason you should uh, you should play with the other dimensional reduction parameters uh, so first of all you probably will want to keep all your components so you would just keep this to be maximum uh, like meaning the number of, uh, so first of all, this is the number of genes. So, so this 50 meaning, right. so still in your data, you have 96 yeah, cells and... 96 cells and like, I don't know, 30,000. Okay, in that case, data, yeah. It's just, it's not nearly as sparse. It's just yeah. there's not very many cells. So the yeah. the algorithm, we're using the default parameter just gets weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know actually myself. Uh, I would be curious to know uh, if anyone else has... Um, Bernie, you, did you help Wilder run it on bulk RNA for TC? Yeah, he had his project with bulk RNA. I don't know. Maybe he did it himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's probably, I don't think most people aren't using fluid MC one anymore because it's expensive and not very many cells, but I just happen to have a data set. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, this has changed to everything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. I'm curious myself. I, I don't know if one of the ideas is to, to use some of these tools on some of our bigger bulk RNA sample uh, projects too, where we have like 20 or 30 samples and then doing this. And I think some people have kind of dipped into it a little bit, but um, I know it is somewhat limiting. Like, um, but but I'm not sure like at where the, if they ended up not doing it or. or I think that what you mentioned, that reduction is really similar. Everybody is the number of cells. That's why we still have that many genes and we want to pass to the cells with some genes. Right, yeah, for the PCA, obviously, yes, there's still so many types of genes. Just maybe the cluster might mm -hmm. something slightly different. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but since the clustering going to run on the reduced dimension, so the, that's the thing, clustering runs actually on on the dimensionally reduced data. Yeah. So in that case, the second step kind of be important. Like if 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 it if the all cells are reduced into, you know, uh, in your case you say T T S N reduces it into just one group or um or all scattered. Yeah, because it builds the graph that it does its um, its manifold finding on with like a k nearest neighbors mm -hmm. approach, and so one of the parameters is the number of nearest neighbors in the graph. So when like you get thirty of them, and that's a third of the data set, which is not finding the it's actual fine structures yeah. because it's like looking for mm -hmm. major structure. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, it's a minor concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, next step is the clustering. Uh, so, the um, a method that, uh, that Markle suggests using is, uh, is a density peak method or DP feature method. And what it does is, 
Uh, the math is explained, and, and I, I, I haven't actually looked at the code to exactly see how it's calculated, but what it does is that for each cell, it calculates a local density, which means uh, basically how many, in a sense, are there are other cells that are near me, okay? Now, after it has these uh, cells with high local density, now it says, okay, what's the closest um, cell with a local density that has is higher than me. It's like if you have a mountain scape, if you have like a set of mountains, you, if you try to see what are my peaks in these mountains and what's the distance of from one peak to the nearest other peak uh, that, that's higher than me, like that. So, so this, on the x-axis you have this local density and the y-axis, it's the distance low, uh, from this P, each peak to, to the, uh, the, the neck, the, a cell with a higher. Um, uh. So in, in that sense, if, in, if, you have, if, you, if you have two cells that are, uh, that are close together, this distance to the next one with a higher density is going to be too, too small. So that means that these two are probably close together. What you want to find is, if you have a cell here with the with the highest uh, local density, and then you, if you have another cell here with the next highest local density, uh, so you say, okay, this is so sorry, I should say probably here. So you say, okay, this is a cell with the highest density. The next one over here, it's, it's going to be over here. So and then and then then you would say, okay, this is probably a good peak. And here there's a cell also with a good peak. So though these, when, you, when you plot them, these are again the cells. So these cells are those that have both a high local density and also a high distance. So you would keep those cells as your, uh, uh, I should say, the center of your clusters, the cluster centers. And the way you specify them, by default you can say, uh, so you, then you have to you have to specify you can specify this in three ways. You can say do this and then pick the top five clusters. Okay. Uh, so we would say okay this is the uh, this is the best next best next best. Basically it will it will do it based on the uh, the y axis the uh, higher density. So that's if you specify the number of clusters. Or you can say, uh, I don't know the number of clusters, uh, I, but I want to specify these two thresholds. And again, this is something that you probably will run the clustering step once. You get this plot, you look at this, and maybe looking at this plot, I want to actually reduce this to be to include this peak as well. Um, um, so, so, so you can either specify these uh, threshold values directly, so you specify this threshold cutoff as well as this threshold cutoff. Again, you can say either do automatically, in which case it would it would find it would uh, get the top ninety five percent basically uh, um, of uh, as the as the row and the top ninety five percent as the. Um, uh, um, I would I think. I manually put these lines. Uh, I think the top 95% would be somewhere uh, here, probably, mm, because there's only few here. So the top 95% would be down there, but still it will pick these five clusters. Or you can actually manually specify them. When you have, when you're looking at this, you can say this is the exact value I want to specify for the row. Uh, and then the result will be the clustering of your cells. Uh, and again, it's going to be doing this in the dimensionally reduced space. You have a question? Yes. Um, is it possible to pass your own clustering data into this? Because I noticed you have a Surat um, app as well. And uh, Samus and Robinson recently came out with paper testing cluster methods. And the Surat one is, is the best on single cell data. Mm -hmm. and so given that Monocle is, you know, it's re-implementing clustering done better using a different system, but obviously mm -hmm. Monocle does the trajectory, trajectory yeah. stuff. Could you pass the, the better cluster, the perhaps more accurate clustering into this? Uh, 
Not right now. Uh, uh, I um, I have to think about like uh, at least through the app. No, obviously, if you, if you run it through R, yes, because you can. You have you run this. So if you run this, the your monocle uh, app object actually gonna have a cluster column, right? right. The column that's called cluster. Uh, you can go and manually modify that uh, as you wish uh, and then save that and then now go back here in, in the app and say open that monocle object again. Including it in the app, uh, right now you can't. I have to think whether there, we can think of a way like allowing user to open another file with the clustering information. Um, I don't know how easy would it be to make a UI around it, I would say. And that being said, the looping method, is that suggested by Monocle as well, or is that...? It's implemented, and then... Uh, that might be more similar to Surat's method, though? Uh, I have not tried them, yeah. Graph clustering method? I just don't know how to make a new graph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's such what Surat's doing. They're doing nothing fancy. It's just, uh, like, graph. Have you method. tried the other two methods, or...? But I think Blueberry is probably similar to yeah. this rest. Yeah, that's um, But um, I believe that there is a catch with them. Either it's uh, slow and, it, it, like, uh, I believe if you, if you have more than 50,000 cells, they say you should use Luan. We have a warning that shows in the app if you have those many cells. It basically run and it says, it's going to say, lose Luan method because you have too many cells or... Um, but that's as as much as I, I I have done with experimenting with this. I I haven't really experimented uh, with which one may work better. I think the only downside of Blue Line Lab uh, is that we don't know how many class of uh, end of this, so we must specify that. So it, it's <laughs> Mm, any other questions? Okay, so now that we have these uh, clusters, uh, we are ready to do the differential expression analysis because now we have these groups of cells and we can compare uh, them and then see which genes uh, actually differ uh, between them. Um, this is if, if we don't have any other information in data. If, if our, in our data we have these phenotype information about the cells, already something that say, okay, this is cells pre-treatment, after treatment, or uh, these are cells on a, a time course. You can specify that for the, uh, so you can, so if, if so, so now that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, if we have that clustering information as a phenotype in the data, right now you can do it, yes. Because you, what you can do here is, uh, so if we do clustering, uh, no, we do differential expression analysis. You have three methods for differential expression analysis. Uh, before explaining them, oops, the output is you would detect genes that you have detected as uh, differentially expressed. And it will plot a certain number of them. You can specify how many of them just to show afterwards. Uh, as differential express, but it will save those the entire genes with the p-value, q-value of them, and whether it was detected as differential express or not as a table file. So you can later open that table, either in Vizar or in a fixed file to, to observe them. But you can just get a preview of what was detected as differentially expressed. Um, so there are a few parameters that you can specify. So you can either say to detect the genes, compare the um, expression of the cell, compare basically all clusters together. Or you can say, do compare one cluster versus the other one. So you can say, I want everything that's in, uh, compare uh, cluster one with cluster two, three, four, in this, and five, in this case we had five clusters. And then compare two with one, three, four, five, and so on. Um, in that case, or, or if you already know that this is a specific cluster because 
because somehow you know that this is the cluster that I think is the important one. Uh, maybe you have plotted it, it with your, again, uh, in Wizard you can actually load this and then plot it uh, based on a specific gene. So you can say that specific gene is uh, highly expressed in this cluster and I want, I think that's, the, that's my marker gene. I want everything to be uh, compared with that cluster. So that's if you use the second method, if you have some prior knowledge. And, and the third one is this phenotype, the cell attribute that we were just talking. So if, if you have some phenotype information, in your case, if you have something like my uh, cluster, my own cluster or something, or Surat cluster, already in the data as a column, then you should be able to use this. I haven't, and it might be buggy, but it, the code is there. If it doesn't work, we have to fix it. Uh, also, if you have marker genes, you have some prior knowledge, you can say, do DE, only uh, don't consider all the genes, uh, only consider these specific genes. If I know like certain, num certain genes, you can, you can list them here, like if you know, if you know your marker genes. Um, and then this is how many to plot. So the result of this would be your, uh, uh, it, it will be a text file. I probably should have put the, the name here, but it would be this uh, text file uh, of DE genes. So the, since we use the all cluster method, it says DE genes all cluster. If you had used a phenotype information, that's a DE gene that phenotype. And it's a text file, but we can also load it in Vizar later, as we see. So it's 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 a, it will sort them based on the Q value of them, and then um, it, these are your DE genes, and then um, these are the genes that weren't detected as differentially expressed. Okay, so now this is probably the most in interesting part. It should have probably been, been at the start, but well, we had to go through uh, the other steps first. But uh, this single cell uh, trajectory, uh, the main three steps to create these trajectories is, first, you have to say what genes I want to use to predict these trajectory. And that's uh, what they call in Monocle as genes to use for ordering, like or, um, ordering genes. And uh, the second step is once you have uh, selected, so, so keep in mind that this is different than the previous dimensional reduction that we wanted to do for clustering to detect the DE genes. This is after we have detected differential expressed genes, Either we can use them for ordering, or we can give our own set of genes for ordering, if we have our own marker genes. Or we can say order based on, again, this phenotype information. If, if I know uh, that uh, these, this is the time point information, I would say, okay, just use that information uh, for ordering. Because uh, I already know that uh, this is stage one at day day one, day two, and so on and so forth. But if you don't have any prior knowledge, you specify uh, a portion of your differential expressed genes, then it uses a dimensional reduction method, uh, DDR3, uh, a graph-based method, to, to lay them out into this trajectory information then it tries to find a tree in that trajectory and then orders the cells on that tree based on the time, pseudo time, that it, it has predicted as, as best describing your, your cells. And so here is the cells, it's just, just projected in two dimensions, and then they are here they are ordered based on pseudo time. So pseudo time zero, uh, these dark ones, and then this is basically as it goes through, these are the cells that it has um, estimated to to be further in the um, 
in the differentiation process or uh, in their, their biological process. So for the, f yes, so these are steps that we already actually have gone through. So to get our differential expressed genes, uh, we already went through them. The part that we have to now specify uh, when we are constructing single cell trajectories is how many of those top DE genes to use. So again, um, I mean, how they come up with this 1,000 is the default they, they say, but maybe you want to go lower or higher uh, based on uh, your own sense of how your data is. Uh, but the default is pick uh, 1,000. And you can also say, I want to have an FDR threshold. Uh, this is basically your Q value. Um, so only pick those genes that pass this, this threshold. You may come up with this uh, looking at your uh, gene, DE genes uh, table that, that you look at uh, uh, a little bit. Later. So this is to pick these genes. Uh, maybe I have a, well, I should have had a zoomed in plot, but it's basically saying, okay, these are the genes, these black ones, to, to pick, uh, to predict the trajectory. So once that that's set, it, it predicts it, and then um, and then it uh, lays them out, and then find basically um, uh, per, um, estimates a pseudo time across this tree that it has constructed. Um, based on the pseudo time, it also divides uh, the cells into states. Uh, so here it has detected the, based on the branches in the tree. It says this is before this branch cells are in these states. After this branch, there's one state. Uh, this is one fate of the cells. Or they can continue further to state two. And then state two, again, branches here, either to state three, or con continues further, and then branches uh, at, uh, I think, continues further, which is state four, or branches to state five or continues to state 6, and then those cells can uh, uh, um, branch again at here to either state 8 or 9. Keep in mind that these are individual cells, so, uh, so it's saying that, okay, this group of cells are the ones that have gone through. So looking at this trajectory, you would uh, say that, okay, this cell is probably a cell that was initially at this state, then it went to this state, then this state, then this state, and now its final fate is, is here, as at that state. Um, that's a predicted one, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and this is again another plot that's added to, to your report. It's a sh if you use a clustering to detect um, the, the genes, um, this will be added, um, or if you use the phenotype, it will basically color them by, uh, by your phenotype. So if you had the phenotype information, um, um, like uh, treated and untreated, the colors here would have been these cells are before and uh, treatment, these cells are after treatment. So you could see if the trajectories make sense uh, according to your phenotype information. But here, since we just use the clustering, the it, colors them based on that clustering information. Okay, so once the pseudotime information is there, uh, you can find genes uh, uh, the, that, uh, that f following the pseudotime. You can say which genes changed, which genes were the determining genes uh, that across the pseudotime. So, oops. so, so now if, if you, if you cluster, so on the x-axis here, it's our um, pseudo time. So this is early and then later. So when it clusters the, say, the specified number of genes, the, the, the say, top 50, um, this is a group that uh, was 
uh, add a lower expression uh, I guess this is the log scale by the way a lower expression at the early stages then high then low these are the group that was low expression and then high uh, near the end of their pseudo time and uh, this group I don't know this group and this group seem to be kind of similar but again you can specify looking at this cluster heat map you can say how you how many clusters you want to have and then last but not least but we can um, analyze what happened in each of these branches so you have these branches you can say analyze branch uh, one and then see for each gene, see what was happening before that branch and after that branch. So you can see here the so it, the, the way to interpret this is that uh, the columns are pseudo time. <coughs> the middle of the plot is the beginning of the pseudo time, and these two ends going to uh, two ends of that branch. So if we uh, if we read it to uh, uh, to the left, we are going uh, to one cell fate, and if we go to the right, we go to the other cell fate at that branch. So these are the genes at that branch, and then uh, so these genes on the one end of the branch they were highly expressed, on the other end they were low um, low. Uh, what's the term? Uh, not expressed. Um, silenced, right? And the, the parameters that uh, have to be specified. This is actually, since this is um, probably the most time consuming part of the app, it's probably about 60-70% uh, of the time for running the entire app going to be spent on this part. Um, right now you can't say do it on all branch points. You have to specify I want to do it on which branch. So you specify I want to do it. So you observe this and say I want to run it on branch number one or two or three or four. So or based on what your, your data you may have different number of branches. So you specify that branch number then you specify the clustering to use for the heat map and then after this, it would it can also plot uh, a specific genes going through the states, and you can say how many of these genes to have in each plot. So these two are sort of more. So the, the third one is more like a visual thing. Uh, so in this case, uh, it will generate uh, this heat map plus since we have specified six clusters for the heat map it will create six of these plots. Um, so each for each of these groups of genes. So this is for uh, genes in cluster one uh, in the branch development at branch number one. So you would see these are the genes uh, like uh, CD3D, it should be here. It, uh, it shows how it went through the states. So in this state uh, it was sort of, I, I would guess, middle, and then this was uh, at almost at the end. It was silenced. So silenced, then maybe partially expressed, silenced. So for this gene and so on, uh, you would get six of these. Uh, um, in this case, if you have fewer number of uh, clusters for the heat map, uh, you would get maybe more or less. Um, I guess uh, that uh, should be any any questions. Well, um, depending on the time, we can quickly show exploring these tables and this are, or we can conclude it here. What do you think? Uh, maybe I'll just show one of them, and then. Um,
so so once you have that output directory you can open also open them in a uh, so so here I have the cells you can actually open them in this R <coughs> and then use the other apps um, so say scatter plot and you drag the cells so these are the TSNI components and now you can actually have a bit more fine control over how your plot uh, look like so so if I want to color this based on uh, 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 number of genes expressed, or um, or in this case clusters. So you you can actually have a bit more um, more control, uh, and and like here you would actually it's um, you can you can say where the those peaks were detected. So. Um, these are the five peaks that were detected. So you can actually do explore those uh, those tables that were uh, um, output. So um, most of these plots that were generated uh, uh, for your report can be reproduced with the information that's saved into those uh, table files. So you can if you based for your own publication if you want to make any modification to this maybe use a log scale or something you can uh, load the table and then so do we have this uh, say uh, total expression per cell or uh, so a num gene expressed and I think it's a total count yeah so uh, so this is to get uh, I guess this plot after the filtering. Oh, so could you load that uh, dispersion uh, mean expression? Oh, actually, this should be the gene because no, are these? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, this 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 should be a genes table. So, so we we have to open the uh, genes table, and then maybe you can get another scatter plot with our genes, and then. Uh, mean expression versus oh maybe it should be log scale too right so uh, for the axes we can choose uh, log 10 and log 10 yeah I zoomed out too much suddenly, uh, but this should be it, right? So now, oops. So, so we wanted. Um, so, so we probably want to reduce the transparency a little bit to see. So you see these lines, uh, these guys. These are. Just because it's a log scale, like those are just are, are because because that means that we didn't have a continuous mean expression value. Like we had only discrete values, and then that's why we see these streaks when then you do the log. Um, for this group, I think uh, Bernie's explanation that this is probably when we have a low mean expression. That's probably um, we gonna. I guess so. Like, um, like the base. It's 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 based on the standard deviation, right? Uh, the calculation. Yeah. Oh, like normalized by me. Oh, I see. Um, on that note, is there a way? Because you were subsetting, or you were selecting genes to use based on um, a statistic, mm -hmm. and one of them was mean expression. Could you use dispersion? Or some sort of variance mean relationship as your way of selecting genes to use downstream. Uh, technically, you should be able to, but it's not added yet. Oh. Like, uh, I mean, if if this is something that uh, we feel it's good, it uh, shouldn't be hard to add that as a as one of the uh, the steps. Yeah. I think there is an argument that you know genes of higher expression are more likely to be the differentiated expression. Oh, is it? Okay. They're different between cells potentially. I don't actually. Mm -hmm. I've never actually tested to see if that's true. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, yeah, uh, that's that's something worthwhile uh, adding if 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 that makes sense. Uh, one thing is that we don't want to expose mm, parameters just for the sake of something that can be done. But if there's a uh, there's a, a sound argument behind it. Uh, Technically, it shouldn't be hard to add any additional like filters. But uh, this is this is um, uh, just the tool in Nacha. You uh, there are tutorials, for especially uh, for Sor if you look at Sorat and uh, Cell Ranger. There is a little bit more if uh, uh, ways of using other apps for further analysis. Uh, uh, you. Uh, can use um, um, like parallel coordinates or offset so you can look at the videos uh, to do that and it's kind of going to be similar uh, so is there any other question